Hello everybody, I'm Rene Ramos, director of the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives, and this is Rewind, the show that looks back on Florida's past with historic film and video. It's time for another trip back into the past, so sit back, relax, and enjoy another episode of Rewind. Racial segregation is a thing of the past, but memories and scars still remain. For some people, planning for the future means building a remote island hideout. And Betty Friedan says the feminist movement has entered a second stage. This is Montage. Hello, I'm Joe Abril. February is Black History Month, a time when we take a look back at influential black people and events that have helped shape attitudes in life today. Diana Gonzalez Duruthi takes us on a retrospective look at segregated Miami and some of the physical and psychological scars that still exist today. There was a time when blacks swimming in the waters of Crandon Park Beach would draw a crowd of onlookers and policemen. Virginia Beach was designated for colored people only. Blacks were forced to ride in the back of buses, and when they were finally allowed inside the Orange Bowl, blacks were seated apart from everyone else in a section of the end zone. They had to use separate restrooms, drink from their own water fountains. Blacks had to fight for years for the right to attend schools with whites, even to share lunch and counter space. Integrated neighborhoods were unheard of. Even in the official city of Miami directory, white residents and their businesses were listed in the front of the book, and there was a separate section in the back for those who lived and worked in what was labeled colored town. When segregation was a way of life here in Miami, it was more than laws on the books or signs that divided blacks from whites. Actual stone and concrete walls were used as barricades along the borders of black neighborhoods that were perceived to be too close to the whites. This wall between the homes on Charles Terrace and Kumquat Avenue at one time was the barrier that separated the black from the white residents in Coconut Grove. The original coral rock wall, eroded by time and weather, is backed up by a concrete block divider with barbed wire strung along the top. Today, most people don't realize this wall's past significance, except for those who lived through it. It signified that this is the dividing line between black and white, where black, black lived on the north side and whites lived on the south side. And it was as if it was a gentleman's understanding, you know, not to try to come and live over on the south side of that wall. Along the median strip on Northwest 12th Avenue between 62nd and 71st Street, some children walk along a narrow strip of concrete, testing out their sense of balance. Little do they know that instead of a place to play, this also was a high wall that once enclosed this black neighborhood. That's why I'm so glad that uh, uh, God takes old people out of the world and brings in new young people so that the old people as myself that, that memory or that significance can be done away with and wiped out. Even though the purpose for these walls is a thing of the past, the effects these concrete barriers had on the people they enclosed is still being witnessed in the present. Francina Culmer is Metro's chief planner for the Coral Gables Redevelopment Project. The original proposal for the brand new housing community in this area off US-1 met with negative reaction from residents because the plan initially called for closing off some of the local streets in this neighborhood that lead to US-1 and putting a protective wall around the area. The neighborhood residents made it quite clear that this was something they did not want to see. And speaking of walls or fences, the connotation is still there that walls and fences can in fact keep people out. So we as planners have had to be a lot more sensitive to that as a social implication, not so much as a planning implication, but a social implication and a, a cultural kind of perception of what walls and closed streets do have. 
this is what's left of the wall that used to separate the black from the white neighborhood here in the Washington Park area of North Miami Beach. Although most of the concrete dividing lines that did exist in Dade County are now gone, or at least have lost their original significance, there are still some barriers that exist today. Perhaps they're not as obvious as a stone wall, but they still serve to polarize our community. Oh yes, certainly indeed. And as long as we live, there will always be barriers and psychological difficulties. It's up to those of us who are in the leadership to try and do away with them. They're not going to just disappear. I have always said that things can be changed, physical things can be changed. I think by the same token, uh, we can change our minds psychologically. Many things have changed since the days of segregated Miami. Some things have not. We see some of the same news headlines today that were on the front pages of the Miami Tropical Dispatch in the late 1940s. And now, instead of segregation, we talk about polarization. Right. Polarization has taken uh, some psychological forms so that we still feel uh, uh, barriers and see barriers that are very much a part of our daily lives. Uh, because the laws have been lifted does not mean that attitudes have changed. You cannot legislate morality. Taking the segregation off the books was supposed to have been a uh, panacea, and everybody was supposed to uh, join arms and love each other, and it really did not happen. And there is fear in the back of some minds that despite all that has been accomplished in the past two decades, history may repeat itself. Uh, we have blacks in some very high places and some influential places making some decisions. But uh, with the present administration in Washington, we're beginning to see losses. And uh, we're beginning now to think more of the past, I think, and to reflect on the barriers that we once had and wonder if, in fact, those kinds of barriers can, uh, again, uh, come into, into play. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. Although it's not always pleasant to recollect the past, by doing so we can all learn valuable lessons we can apply to the future. Last week Montaz visited a home complete with its own bomb shelter, but that's only one small survivalist solution to a world that some people believe is falling apart. Most survivalists, in fact, are not concerned with the threat of nuclear war. Their fears lie in the economics of survival. It's memories of the 30s and depressions and Liberty City of 1980 that motivate most survivalist plans. Nancy Ross reports. Close to all the comforts of modern life, yet tucked into a marsh that's impossible to see from the mainland, is another survivalist solution to bad years coming. It's a Noah's Ark of the 80s, an undercover community that's looking back to pioneer days as its way of coping with possible economic gloom and doom ahead. And like the biblical ark, everything must be ready before disaster hits. We call the owners of this island Tom and Carl, which are not their real names. Secrecy is the main ingredient of any survival plan, so it's important to keep identities and locations private. They also don't like being linked with their more militant survivalist brothers. Uh, they portray, quote, survivalists as somewhat kooks, uh, bomb shelter types, uh, gun toting, double gun toting, if you will, uh, idiots, really, who are out in some remote area in a uh, fortress-like activity uh, with their hoard of food and ammunition and guns and they're going to fight off the rest of the world uh, comes Armageddon. And that's not what we're creating here at all. What they are creating is a community of what they call like-minded people, a select group learning how to be self-reliant in a very select environment. I'd use the term realist, really. But we basically want to be in a position and are working towards a position where we could grow enough, fish enough, have enough store that we would be able to take care of ourselves and our family in any eventuality. 
the master plan overcame large amounts of time, money, and resistance from all levels of government. The men bought and developed the land with a license to operate as a fishing camp. That's how the site is known to the surrounding community, if anyone realizes it's there at all. Tom and Carl advertise for tenants mostly by word of mouth, and sometimes in survival publications like this one. Members are selected carefully. With room for a total of 40 families, only six spots are left to fill. The talent that's been selected so far reads like the who's who directory of professions, from mechanics to medicine. Well, we decided that if we were going to be self-sufficient, we'd best have a doctor or more, a dentist, uh, somebody conversing with uh, legal affairs, uh, somebody who was uh, competent in electricity, in plumbing, in carpentry, uh, in electronics. Uh, believe it or not, we think uh, public relations is important. We have teachers. Uh, almost any of the, the activities that would be sufficient uh, to be self-sufficient, uh, that's the type of people that we wanted and have attracted in our group. Tom and Carl insist they accept minorities into their circle, but in this interview with GEO magazine last year, they claim to have an all-white membership. The reality is that you have to be reasonably well-to-do to be a survivalist, a built-in prejudice that sometimes equates the movement with race or class war. It's always seemed to me that, that the survivalist movement itself is a movement that's being taken by people of the upper middle class, if you will. That is, you've got to have some discretionary income to go and either buy a piece of land and stock it with stuff or to even stock your home closets with extra food. If you don't have that, you've got the problems of just eating every day. Only one road connects the island to the rest of the state, constructed by the owners themselves. It assures them of privacy, and it's another way to stay safe. Right, we have about 166 acres of marshland that surrounds our property, which makes, that's what makes our property inaccessible. And I would rather have that kind of security than live in a congested area and have to de have, uh, arm myself, because anybody can walk in, you see? So this, for us, was a, a nice alternative. Another safety feature of the marsh is the alligator concentration, estimated at 70 gators per square mile. There are some camp rules. Each family, for example, must keep at least a six-month food supply in their home. Other provisions, like weapons, are a personal choice. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't have any tanks, and we don't have any machine gun turrets. And no, we don't, we don't have any, uh, any ammunition requirements. So you're not exactly prepared to survive a nuclear holocaust? We are. No, we're not. Uh, we don't have any bomb shelters. Uh, we have no... Uh, no provisions made for a nuclear holocaust, no. What the men have provided for is the day when the economy falls apart and society erupts. In doing so, they found self-sufficiency doesn't happen overnight. The basics of growing food, pumping water, and generating power had to be learned by these ex-city dwellers. And the only way you can become self-sufficient is to do it yourself, and in times of problems, you can't pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, come cultivate my land for me. A thick forest has made way for what's now a fruit orchard and vegetable garden, complete with sprinkler system. What we did with the area right here that we're going to look at, uh, it was exactly like you see here, solid trees. Now people uh, who talk about uh, establishing a self-sufficient uh, area assume that the trees magically fall down and take care of themselves, but it took some weeks to clear all the trees out, uh, there's no free lunch. This is free enterprise, and if a family wants a garden, they have to do the back-breaking work to make it into a garden. The and problem of sewage was tackled with a treatment plant which stands right off the island. There's a water system, too, complete with its own well and windmill, all homemade. Family volunteers laid miles of underground pipe used for water, as well as for power and communication lines. They also dug out a freshwater pond about 20 feet deep. Stocked with fish, it's a source of food and recreation. It seems almost possible to go back to the land if your return is well planned for, but critics of the system say there's trouble in paradise. To cut oneself off and to, to try to say, we are going to be able to be self-sufficient in this particular place, totally self-sufficient, is to forget how many ways we are, in fact, tied into the rest of the system whether it's uh, simple tools, even uh, those kinds of groups that, that have been going out to rural places and starting uh, agricultural communes and growing all their own food and doing all their own stuff, they still have to go into town when uh, their, their uh, axe and their shovel get all rusty. 
Tom and Carl think the reason for the small number of retreats like theirs is not because it's impossible to be self-sufficient, but because most people don't have the willingness to carry through. It has to be done on the basis that this is something that you want to do because this is the lifestyle you want to lead. And that has to be the motivation. And it's been tried many times without that motivation, and every single time has been unsuccessful. Now, we've been successful with it because we're concerned about ourselves and our families. And that's the only reason. Otherwise, you would give it up long in advance. What is that motivation? What divides survivalists from the majority of us that are busy enough with living from day to day? Are we more optimistic about the future, or do survivalists have a better sense of reality? One psychiatrist weighs the options this way. In the end, I, I hope it's not true, but in the end, the survivalist may be the most realistic. But I think from the practical, uh, uh, hopefully most likely scenario, we will not have uh, an eco economic catastrophe or a nuclear holocaust and to spend a lot of time and energy preparing for a like unlikely possibility uh, uh, probably is not uh, for the bulk of us. Uh, I think that uh, enjoying one's life, being productive and and voting and participating in one's government uh, uh, is uh, uh, hopefully sufficient to ensure uh, a reasonable life for us. The choices we make for our future, then, depend on each person's view of what the future holds. Miami-Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. We have a, a living legend with us tonight, uh, Betty Friedan, who I think, uh, uh, Betty, we, could we call you the mother of the feminist movement? Is that a fair uh, appellation? Or? If you want. <laughs> okay. She has written this book, uh, which is currently uh, available, called The Second Stage, and it's a uh, continuation of her thesis of uh, the role of women in America, which began in 63 with your book, Betty, The Feminine Mystique, which you're modest, but most people consider it the beginning point for a great many revolutionary changes in our attitudes towards women, about them and of themselves. Um, you happy with what's happened since that first book came out almost 20 years ago? Well, what's happened are marvelous, life-opening, life-affirming changes, uh, which we could never have predicted. We have changed our lives as women. My daughter's generation simply takes these rights for granted, and perhaps a little um, uh, foolishly, because they are under attack now. So that on the one hand, you know, all research shows that it's that women today is much, are much better off than they were. Their mental health, you know, women in their 40s and 50s today are better off than they were in their 20s and 30s. And I was reading a, a new research study that said that because of the new self-respect and equality of women, and not that it's complete yet, but it's, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit, that not only is women's mental health better, but so is man's. You know, that's an interesting thing. Um, also, we take ourselves seriously as people now. We are taken seriously as people. We have assumed our human and American birthright, equal opportunity, and we've made breakthroughs. But well, there are a lot of new problems, and reactionary forces would try to push women back. Even right here in Florida, they're, they're trying to prevent us from ratifying the ERA. And, but I wrote the second stage because I hear with the young women, and men too, and women not so young, that, be, that we are in a different place now. Mm -hmm. And there are a new set of problems that have no name. And these new questions cannot be seen just looking at the w independent woman and not women against men. But we've got to come to some new terms about family and new terms about work and give women really good choices about having children. And we're not going to get the restructuring of home and the restructuring of work that we need unless unless we understand that men are in a different place now. But I have a lot of criticism has, has come from, about this book from the left, from active feminists who seem to be saying that you're kind of doubling back on everything you said in The Feminine Mystique. I don't see it that way, but that's what the it, critics say. I don't, don't believe that, you know. I haven't exactly joined the so-called moral majority, which is neither. Right. Um, and, 
everything that I say in the second stage is simply a going on, an evolution, mm -hmm. a moving forward. There is no going back. What's worrying me are the forces that would try to push us back. Uh, the uh, degree of equality of one is so vital and so essential that, um, uh, you know, what I, reason that I say we must begin to look at the new questions is that this is where the younger women and, and the women that are living all this, that's where they're at. And I mean, like, you know, I, I'm saying we have to break through certain new mystiques like superwoman. Mm. Superwoman, a lot of tired superwomen out there, you know, we can't. What do you mean by that, superwoman? Well, well women are in jobs and professions today because they must be the economic necessity right. you can't buy a house today in inflation unless there are two incomes um, and they're lucky to be in somewhat better jobs and professions than were open to them before as a result of the women's movement okay she's in this job or in this profession and it is structured around the lives of men that had wives to take care of all the details of life and furthermore, in terms of the man that his whole male identity was his score in the rat race and he had to carry the burden alone, so that it was all, you know, super competitive. And then she d doesn't feel very confident, so she feels that she has to do it even harder than the man to get ahead. So then she goes home, and she's still taking it on herself, m the most of the responsibility for the home and the children in terms of the women <coughs> in the past that had to find their whole identity, whole power, whole control, perfectly run home, perfectly controlled children, because they didn't have any power uh, or control of their but, life. But to put it in some perspective, let's get down to the nitty gritty. The woman works all day like the man works all day, but when they get home at night, the woman she does. has to get the dinner ready. She has to worry about the laundry and the ironing and the cleaning the floor and the mopping no. and the cleaning the bathrooms and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of tired superwomen out there. Right. And, uh, or younger women who say, oh, you know, I can't be a superwoman, so making either or choices. and. And, and, and postponing the choice to have a child or, or agonizing over it. Now, it's, these are not, I mean, these problems, we just must face them and realize that yeah. what required are new arrangements. And men, this, we cannot look at this as just a woman's problem. Men are changing. Men are sharing much more on the parenting. I mean, I think, you know, I want to make it say, you're a second stage man because you want more in your life than just being that rat race. Right. And Kramer versus Kramer, movies like that, really hit a note. Well, men want the goodies that come from the human contact, the having of the children. And this explodes if they haven't done it in midlife, and we call it the midlife crisis. Mm. But younger men are saying they want more out of life earlier. So there's a readiness in men from their own needs to move in, new, in a new direction. Now what we've got to do is to just get some really new arrangements. We must accept the fact, obviously, that women still bear children. Right. And uh, there is some bond between a baby and its mother that's not duplicated by the father. Wouldn't you, would, do you think that's true? Well, you know, I'm not denying the difference between woman and man. In not. fact, we're going to begin to be aware of the, of, you know, really where some of those positive differences are as, right. as women. Be, I mean, I, I, I love to see women, for instance, traveling salesmen used to be the man. Right. I went out on, with my book, The Second Stage, I was just finished the book tour. Uh, in places like Atlanta, um, uh, uh, Dallas, Houston, I mean, the, 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 the sales manager is a woman, and I love the way she does it. She does it in a slightly different way than the man. She has some skills. I don't know whether they come from her biology or whether they come from just this closeness to life that women have been allowed to have, yeah. have been specialized to, that's given them some sensitivities and strengths that men don't have. And when they apply that into work, uh, like a profession that's up before that, been sort of the bluster of the man, mm. they do it, the, the way they do it is so great, so special. You see, in the first stage, I think that women still were um, suffering from some of the self-denigration that ca came from the put down of women by society. Right. So we try to be equal to men, and, and, and we had to in a way, to break through the barriers that kept us out of all the power and the experiences and the activities and the work that had real value put to it because man had done it. Right. But now, in the second stage, we're going to have a whole new value on the strengths that women have had from those experiences and work and activity like childcare that had been specialized to the female. To the but men will share those more and right. they will get some of those strengths. And that's what I see happening. Words like tenderness, caring, sympathy, uh, uh, all the kinds of gentle sides 
that are so critical to our emotional health and our well-being. Betty, thanks very much for all you have done for all of us, and not just women, but for all people who want to have a richer life. And to ladies like Roxy Bolton here in South oh, Florida, Roxy Bolton, who years wonderful. ago stood alone. She was so pregnant and when she started now down here. Indeed. But I say what you've got to do in Florida is get that ERA ratified. Well, I don't know if that's going to happen, but a lot of us hope it does. Okay. Betty, thank you very much. We'll be right back. Miami-Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Will South Florida ever get a modern stadium facility to showcase our Dolphins and possibly attract a Major League Baseball team? That issue is getting a lot of attention from politicians and civic leaders in three counties these days, but there doesn't seem to be much movement toward actually getting the stadium built, at least as much as some people would hope. What does it take to actually have a stadium? We'll look at this difficult problem next week. That's our montage for this week. I'm Joe Abel. That's about it for this edition of Rewind. Just time to remind you that Rewind features historical film and video from the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives. To see more from the Wolfson Archives collections, visit our website, wolfsonarchives.org. You can search the archives catalog and watch video online. And be sure to connect to our YouTube channel where you will find hundreds of carefully curated clips or link to the Wolfson Archives Facebook page to keep up with our busy calendar of historical happenings. Until next time, I'm Rene Ramos. Thanks for watching. Oh, wow.